All right, ladies and gentlemen, Larry Lawton here for another great edition of our interviews. I got Michael Frances, who is an amazing guy. Uh, Michael and I came from the same neighborhood, and we grew up in the same kind of lifestyle. Uh, he was obviously a lot bigger than I was. I was, a, I was a grunt who was making a lot of money for a lot of people. But uh, I was pretty crazy, and I was, they called him, and he'll know what that is, a cowboy. And uh, I want to welcome you to the show, Michael. Well, thanks, Larry. And I got to say this before you start. Uh, every other comment on my YouTube channel is, when are you going to sit down with Larry Lawton? That's it. I hear it all the time, and uh, I want to congratulate you. You've been doing a great job in following you. And I, uh, I'm going to disagree with you. You made a lot of money for a lot of people. That's not a grunt. That's an important guy. So you did well back then. I, I did. You know, they liked me. I even had to sit down because of uh, disrespecting someone, but I got backed up because I was making a lot of money for a lot of people as the biggest jewel robber in the country. And obviously the set up and all that. But this is not about me. It's going to be about you, Michael, because I, I want to get into your life a little bit. My fans, exactly. Are you going to in, 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 interview Michael? Are you going to interview him? Yes, I said. And I reached out to your camp and they said, yes, uh, you know, Michael can do something and we'll do something set up. And we set it up pretty good and pretty quickly. You know, you guys have been great, too. I want to say that as well. All right. A couple of questions. Growing up in Brooklyn, Michael, you have the Grillo name. Yeah. It really, you know, and I talk about this in my, my, one of my partners early up in Brooklyn was Joey Grillo. I don't know if you knew Joey Grillo. Joey was doing the drugs. I was doing the robberies. We were out of West 10th over there with the Gambinos and Dominic and Willie. You probably know them all over in home stretch. Yes. The Weeper and Dominic and, you know, Gatto who owned the yes. bus company on Atlantic. But you know all the crew. And, uh. Well, Joey was a really close friend. He ended up dying at like 45, a heart attack. But uh, when I went to prison, it was, it was tough. Him and I grew up in that business together. And he was the drugs, which we all know there were out there. I love that. Oh, they don't do drugs. Come on. We all were partying, doing everything there was. But did you know him or did you know his family maybe? Does it ring a bell? No, I didn't. You know, I, I had the name at the time, but I really didn't know any of them. You know, it's a, it's a crazy story with me, Larry. I don't know if you want to get into it or not, but... Yeah, absolutely. Crazy story. You know, my father, Sonny Francis, meets my mother when she's 16 years old. She's a hat check girl over at the store club. My dad is married at the time to another woman, Ann Schiller, had three children. Has an affair with my mother, she gets pregnant allegedly, with me, okay? My dad can't get divorced. At that time, you weren't allowed to get divorced, you know, in our life. And so my grandparents on my mother's side were so enraged that my mother was pregnant. First, they wanted her to, uh, to abort me. She said no. So they kind of forced her to marry this guy, Louis Grillo. And that's where the name came from. And then um, I never met him. I, I've never seen him. I mean, I heard of him. I, I knew of him, but I never met him. And then, uh, you know, my father does get the divorce. Uh, he marries my mother, adopts me, legally adopts me when I was a kid. And uh, that's the only thing I ever heard of Grillo. And my father, Sonny, if that was ever mentioned, he got enraged. He never wanted to hear it, never mentioned it. So really, Sonny's the only father that I know. So I, you know, Larry, people said, Mike, why don't you get a DNA test? You know, why don't you find out the truth? It really doesn't matter to me. I mean, Sonny's the only dad I knew, and what's it going to prove, you know? And anyway, the Lewis Grillo, he died, uh, I think, in 74, 75. So I never had a chance, really, to even meet him. If that was my father, I, I don't know. Do, do you ever, did you, did you think you were adopted for a long time? I mean, up until later in life or earlier? I, you know, my father would never say that. We never had a conversation about it. As far as he was concerned, I was, you know, his son. My mother never said a word, but interestingly enough, she told this story to the, the co-author of my first book, and she said, you know, everybody thinks that there was something else. Let me tell you the truth. It was never revealed before, and it's the last chapter in my book. When I found out about it, I said, Mom, why did you never tell me? She said, it's not important. You know, that's your father, and that's it. And, you know, she brushed it off. So <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but, uh, you know, that's the story. And I've never said this before, you know, publicly. But you asked, and you brought it up, and, you know, I thought it was appropriate to say it. Well, no, obviously, I mean, I read about you, Mike. I read some of that. And what I didn't know about you not thinking you were adopted, obviously, for X amount of time. At what time did you realize you weren't adopted or that, or, some, or you don't know to this day? No, you know, I, I really don't know. I mean, it was, uh, 
I, I can't say it was never really important to me. I mean, Sonny was the only father that I knew. I didn't want to deal with it. You know, there was stuff going on in the house, you know, so as far as I was concerned, he was dad, and that was it. And I don't know if I just shut it out, Larry, or what. I mean, and he was a great father, great, great father. I mean, he supported me, loved me. So, you know, why did I have to investigate anything else? That's how I looked at it. Yeah, that's good. Two questions in there jump right out, Michael. Uh, two, did you ever think of Ancestry? DNA. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I mean, my, it, someone's going to ask me that. That's why I had to You know what? That. My kids want me to do it. And I said, no. And they're saying, Dad, wh why don't you do it? And I said, I don't want to do it. What's it going to prove at this point in time? Is How is it going to change my life? But it's funny. For the last two or three years, they've been on me. Dad, you got to do it. You got to. I said, I'm not doing it. You know, and now I won't do it just because I said I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're hard-headed on that. You know? yeah. well, I just thought, because just to look where your family heritage went way back. I mean, obviously, you know, if it, whatever it is, where, where it went, but that's okay, obviously, I visit. And, and I do On know, that, no. you know, just so you know, I do know, I mean, every my mother's whole family comes from Naples, Napoli. My father's whole family comes from Napoli, and the Grillo's all come from Napoli. So whatever it is, I'm Neapolitan, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, you're Neapolitan. <laughs> the uh, question for you on that one, now, I read where it said that your father actually agreed on a hit on you. Did that? I mean, obviously, you have love for your father, like I do. Obviously, everybody does. I hope. Uh, how did that hit you, as in a personal way, Michael? You know, it hurt. I mean, that's what the FBI had told me uh, when they tried to get me to cooperate. You know, in a big. I know that. I know what they do. Yeah. You know, they basically came into prison and said you're a dead man anyway, and they gave me all this stuff. You know, Persigos put a hit out of you. Your father's gone along with the contract. And you know, at the time, I said, well, what do you expect him to do? You know, I'm walking away from that life. I don't want to endanger my father in any way. Uh, so what do you expect him to do? He's got to live there. And um, did I believe it? You know, Larry, I know my father would have never put a gun to me. No way. But I, I, it's painful to say this, but might have he just stepped aside? I don't know. You know, he was such, my father's whole legacy was his upstandingness in that life. That meant more to him than anything in life, I have to say it, to a, to a fault, because I think my family was tremendously hurt by that, by that position. I don't mean me, I mean my brothers and sisters and my mother. But, um, you know, look, we patched it up later when he knew that I wasn't putting people in trouble and that's not what I wanted to do. And, you know, I resisted that and every, you know, the people talk and they don't know the real story. Um, but I would never put anybody in prison. That was not my goal. So uh, we patched it up and he understood and, you know, he sent word out, my son's not gonna hurt anybody. And that was the end of it, you know. Still mad at me for walking away. I mean, Persico was extremely upset with me for that, but, you know, I made that decision. Well, you know, well, we're going to get into that in a minute, but it's so true, because like, even in my case, Michael, like, uh, I wouldn't tell. I went away on a RICO act alone. I was caught under the RICO, robbery through RICO, and they got me in interfering, I, the Hobbs Act, it's called, interfering with interstate commerce uh, by way of racketeering. So they ended up getting me, and they wanted everybody, everybody, Dominic, Willie, they got nobody, nobody. And I was one of the only guys to this day who went away on a RICO act alone. That's you right. Know, RICO. Yeah. So it's funny because I said that my partner was John Rodriguez. How many John Rodriguez you think of in Miami? <laughs> a couple <laughs> of we, hundred thousand. Yeah, we imp improvised, Michael. We, because I didn't want to put people away either. And I said, hey, how do I could get a, a plea deal to get? I got four 12 year sentence. I beat a life sentence. So they dropped the gun on a preliminary hearing. If I lose that gun charge, you know how the law works. I would have got five for the first 20, 20, 20. That's right. And I would have been away for 100 years on the gun charge. Obviously, I got a little bit. And the FBI, you know, you mentioned something else, and I'm going to jump this right in, and you can elaborate on it. You said something about one of your, your podcast uh, videos that you, you, you know Joe Pistone. Yes. And obviously, yeah, I mean, I know very Judge Gallardo, uh, Judge Gale from Miami, very well-known uh, judge, very good friend of mine. He wants me to go to Italy with them to talk about crime and stuff like that in Italy. And Joe Pistone, and I have no issues against any cop, even the FBI that caught me, like you said, they did their job. Who am I to say, uh, oh, you know, you shouldn't do your job or something like that? Because I get the same thing. Hey, Larry, 
Listen, I'm the only ex-con in the United States, Mike, who's actually an honorary cop. Really? And I don't like cops. And I don't like cops. <laughs> I mean, just because what's going on. But a good cop I like because I tell people, listen, if your house is robbed, you call 411 or 911. You call 911. Exactly. I don't want somebody robbing my mother. And that's not ratting. My mother's supposed to call the cops. Exactly. Something happens, obviously. But, and, I, and I respect good cops. Now, don't be dirty. Don't disrespect me. Don't beat me. Don't try to do this. Don't set me up. You mentioned that. And I really had a lot of respect for that because, I, again, we come from that life that, hey, listen, we were dodging them our whole lives. I mean, that's what we did. I dodged the cops. And I never worried about local cops, Michael. They, they would, like, forget them. They didn't have the money to follow me around. The feds, whole nother Different difference. story, yeah. Do you remember... The wars, the, I was in the kind of middle of the Colombo Wars in the 90s, early 90s. You were away already, out of that life, because you went to prison in 91 again, correct? Yeah, I went back in just a couple of months before the war started. It was heating up at that point. And what happened, I had done uh, almost five years. I was in 85 to uh, end of 89. I get out on parole. I'm out on parole for about 13, 14 months. And that's when this whole thing is starting to brew with Little Vic. And, um, you know, I got sent for because I hadn't hurt anybody. You know, I wasn't doing anything. People, is this guy in? Because, Larry, it was on the street that I was going to testify against anybody because the FBI, FBI did me very dirty. They put my name on the witness list of trials that were mm. coming up to put pressure on me and to make everybody think I was going to snitch. But what happens is these trials are coming up and I never appear. And then I get violated. And guys say, well, maybe he's not hurting anybody. Because, you know, most of the time, if a guy's walking away, you know that. He's made a deal, and, and it's going to be trouble. Oh, and, of course, they don't absolutely. say it up front, but then he appears. Well, I never appeared. And um, so now they're starting to call me back. There's going to be a war, you know, whose side are you on? My father sent word to me. I'm starting to feel this pull again to go back. I feel like I'm betraying. Because, I, you know, Larry... I used to go to sleep at night, walking away from the life, waking up, going back into it. Because, you know, I was so much a product of it. I was my father's son. I felt horrible, like I was betraying my oath, betraying. And it was very difficult for me to make that move. It wasn't like, oh, okay, I'm just going to go. It was really hard. And, uh, and then what happens, I was really thinking about going back. Because, you know, they made an attempt on Vic, and then they were trying to settle it amicably. And each side wanted to take over, and nobody was resisting. That's when the war started. And the war started just when I went to prison. It started in November of 91. I get violated in November of 91. As a matter of fact, wow. I, got, I got violated November 13th, 1991. The war was starting. And so any idea I had of maybe going back, you know, I say God changed, <laughs> he changed the course of my life. You know, at that time, I was in the height of my, I went away in 96, and I was in the height, I was really strong from 88 to 96, making a ton of money for a lot of people. The Gambinos over there on, on the West 10th. So we were told, hey, listen, don't go down there, though, you know, 11th Avenue, and don't go down that area because we can't protect you. All the clubs there, you remember you had over on 3rd Avenue, uh, then the one on uh, 16th, and then uh, West 16th. Had. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the, all of those clubs. I was married, Michael, in uh, Regina Pate's church. Oh, yeah. And I was, and my wedding was the Oriental Manor. Oh, really? Which you know, yeah, sure. on 18th Avenue and 86th Street. But, and that was a crazy wedding. But anyway, besides that, the, the war was like, affected everybody because it was like, don't go there. You knew friends, you did deals. And I knew Vic. I mean, I got to know Vic very later. I was in prison with Vic for a long time. And then I knew, obviously, Black Dom. I used to sell what he's a good guy. You know who he is. Yeah, yeah. Black Dom. And then, of course, Bill disappeared, Cthulhu, and all that kind of stuff. But I look at that and I say, listen, what am I doing in this? I was just a cowboy who made a lot of money for a lot of people. I ended up going to Florida. And when I went to Florida, I used to have to come back every month because I was doing business. I was right. doing bad business, you know, breaking someone's arm, doing a lot of crazy stuff. And I think about guys like yourself who made a ton of money. Listen, Michael, everybody, my audience doesn't know, so you could know. Uh, if, give them a little quick thing about your tax scam. Well, you know, long story short, uh, with the help of another guy who brought me the idea and the deal, he was into it a little bit. 
He had figured out a way to defraud the government out of tax on every gallon of gasoline. He had a small operation. He brought it to me because he was being extorted by two other guys <clears throat> and another family. So I made them disappear, and then we got into business yeah. together. And over a period of eight years, after I brought the Russians into the fold, we, would, we were selling a half a billion dollars of gas a month, and we were taking down 30, 40 cents a gallon. There was times we were bringing in 10, 12 million a week, 8 million a week. You know, it all depended on what the sales were. And, you know, I tell people I wasn't putting that in my pocket, but I was doing pretty good. You know, the family was earning well off of me and everything else. But we, we, we were making a tremendous amount of money. I mean, I had a jet plane, I had a helicopter, I had houses all over the country. And, you know, uh, it, it, was, it was one of the biggest schemes, I think, since the days of Prohibition, because it was that easy. Uh, when I say easy, the money was flowing that easy. It was a sophisticated operation, but once we really got it down, Larry, it was it a was, uh, cash register. That's all it was. Mike, I knew about it. Obviously, I heard about it, you know, when I was making out, because I made a lot of money for people, but they used to always say, oh, get the gas scam if you could do that, you know what I mean? I used to tell them, then, of course, I heard all the stories from the old times when we were playing gin in the place and all that. Oh, they, 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 he had the best thing ever going and whatever. And they got caught and all this kind of stuff, and I laughed. I used to say, everyone gets caught, you know that. Right. I mean, really. But... So you did that, you made a lot of money. That's what must have made, like even myself, Michael, people ask me that I ever want to get back. Cause to this day, I know I can do it. I could still take down a jewelry store and I still had nobody went to prison, not my fences, anybody. And of course, morally, I don't want to do things. I, I want to do the right thing. I want to help people. I want to make sure kids don't think that's the way to go. Cause look what happened to me. I went away from 34 years old to 46. Best years of my life, I'm in prison. You know, best earning, best uh, relationships, anything. And no matter how much money we made, you can't get that time back with your kids or whoever it is. Like I lost with my kids. It's hard. And, and you know, right. it's not that easy when you get out to start to rebuild after everything collapsed on you. You know, Larry, people don't understand that. They, oh, you got tons of money buried and all this kind of stuff. They don't realize it's hard after you take a fall like that to get back on your feet. And, you know, I don't know about you, but when I come out to California... I'm like a fish out of water. I'm saying, you know, yeah. this is not my thing. What do I, I mean, okay, I had a head for business, but I got to get started again. I'm on parole. I got people looking for me. And, you know, you're trying to rebuild your life. It's not easy. It's not easy. Oh, absolutely not. And what people don't understand also is they say, like my, my buddies used to say to me, good guys, big guys, they used to say, listen, Larry can't get out and go work for somebody at $12 an hour. He's going to kill somebody. He's going to, you know, it's not, you, you made too much money. You were in a good position where you had, I had my crew and nobody went to prison on my crew at all. With money comes problems, as we say. So when you had the houses, the home, the planes, the boats, did you look over your shoulder more? Oh, no doubt, Larry. You know, the sad thing about it, and you know, one thing I committed myself to do, I wanna make it clear. I didn't leave the life because I was mad at anybody, because I wanted revenge on anybody. I left the life because I wanted to preserve my life and that of my families. That was it. So it wasn't like, I don't go back and start talking negative about people because I know this was the life. This is, this is what you face. So yes, I'm making all of this money. And I'll tell you what happened. There was a story come out of, I'm, I'm giving the family $2 million a week. $2 million a week. I, there's a story that comes out in a newspaper I forget what, I think it was Newsday, I'm not sure, that I was making billions of dollars. And now everybody's looking at me like, maybe I'm get, not giving up the right amount. And I get called in and they're grilling me and all this, and I'm a captain at that point. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I had authority, but, and then I find out that, uh, you know, they're starting to talk to my Russian friends, my partners, like, hey, you know, trying to get them, you know, in, in their confidence and all of that, which they wouldn't do, they were loyal to me. So I'm saying, oh, you know what? I got to watch myself here. It's, it's part of the life. I get it. You know, you got to understand that. I never said anything. I wasn't looking to, you know, go to war or any st stuff like that. Discussed it with my dad. My dad said, look, just be careful. You know, we got to watch ourselves, how we operate. Our time will come. Because my dad, Larry, I'll be honest with you. My dad said, one day you're going to be the boss. Because my, my, my father always felt that that was his rightful position. If he didn't go to jail, I believe he, it was him and Junior, him and Persico, and probably him because 
I, I just feel that way, you know, from what I knew, sensed on the street. But at any rate, he said, one day you're going to be the boss, and I'll be there. Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll you know, uh, advise you and do everything. That's how he felt. That's how he was looking at the future. So he always would tell me, just bide your time, Mike. You know, try to stay out of trouble. Be low key. Do what you got to do. But yeah, I mean, I've, I felt the heat. There was no doubt about it. And, uh, you know, people are watching everything you're doing. He's driving in a plane. He's got this house. He's doing a helicopter, you know. And I tried not to flaunt it, you know, and I was, I made everybody around me earn. I, I did that. Everybody made a living around me. You were in my crew. You were making money. That was it. So, uh, but you know, it's a product of the life. You got to watch yourself. It's, it's a treacherous life in many ways. And you know that. You know, it's funny because that happened to me in a smaller way. I was making a lot of money bringing the diamonds in. And I was actually getting rid of my diamonds, Michael, through the Genovese's down in Little Italy. And I had my connections and all, and everybody's happy. I'm bringing guys bags of cash of 50,000 and diamonds. Oh, look at this. I don't know how many mobs has got my diamonds. You know what I mean? Oh, it looks like I take it, take it. You know? maybe, maybe I got so some. Anyway, you probably got some of mine. <laughs> but the, it was funny because I had my own guy come to me, one of our crew, and say, Larry, you got to come to us. What do you mean I got to come? I got a good thing going here. Leave this fucking thing alone. And Dominic, our boss, you know him. Yeah. And he says... He goes, no, Larry, Larry's answering to me. And that was it. He was our captain, you know, and, and he made sure I answered him. That was the end of story. I didn't have to deal with anything. But it was like, oh, shit, I felt that pressure. What happens if I didn't have, you know, as they call the rabbi to help you, you know, your own rabbi to help you? And I'm lucky because I was making money, but I used to sneak back down to Florida, do my thing, robbed up and down the East Coast, come to New York, boom, 24 hours, everyone's making money. I'm down at La Polina's. You remember La yeah. oh, in, yeah. in uh, Brooklyn? And then I'm going to Little Italy and I'm eating at Fratelli's and Positano's and eating my, you know, getting big and fat, what I did, <laughs> and making money. But the uh, I felt that I, I felt for you because I said, a guy like Michael who's making so much money, jealousy jumps in there. And you know the life we live was a treacherous life. I always say, as much, there were times I look back now, Michael, I said I could have been killed. And I wonder if it was a setup and it just didn't go right or something happens. I remember being in a house and it just didn't write and something that sixth sense got me up and said, I'm out of here and I left. And I just don't know if it, if it was, you know, what, what was gonna happen. You know, they thought he had cash in a car. You know, it could have been, you know, I, I, I confide in you too on this with, with your audience. I got a, uh, 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 I was sent for by Chin, Giganti. Fritzi Givinelli, who was very close to me, he was a big uh, bookmaker and uh, very close with uh, Chin. He says, Mike Chin wants to see us. So I go see him, and we're walking on Houston Street, and he's got his bathrobe on, and, you know, he hasn't <laughs> shaved in God knows how long. But on uh, that uh, act, he was, he was uh, smart as a fox. So, very sly, very sly. And as we're talking, he says to me, listen, you ever have trouble with Junior? He says, you let me know. He says, I'll bring you over here with me. Now, I'm saying, did he hear something, you know, that maybe I didn't know about? You know what I mean? Did he, did he hear something? And I think later on, the way certain things happened, I think he might have heard something. Now, naturally, I said, you know, Chin, I really appreciate it. I mean, I wasn't jumping ship or anything. Even though when I told my father, my father said, you should go with Chin. They got a big crew there. <laughs> Your old dad said that yeah. away from the crew. Yeah, he, That's funny. He always <laughs> say, but my dad always says things after the fact, you know? He never tells you up front. <laughs> So, uh, but anyhow, you know, I, I always wondered, you know, were they watching me that closely? And I think they were, but, you know, what, look, it's part of the life. I mean, you accept that when you get in there. A hundred percent. Now, let's get a little family stuff. First of all, you really had me smiling with boxing because uh, I was into boxing too. I don't know if you know who Michael and Roger King were. Michael King was the King world. Yes, yes. They were billionaires and they loved boxing and my buddies are boxing. Doc Boxer, big down here in Florida, all over the national. In fact, I was going to be uh, head, run of the USA Boxing. They wanted me to be at the head of the USA Boxing. I know the whole industry very well. And you had the story about Don King. And I have stories. And I laugh because I'll have to tell a few about Don King, what he tried to do with a friend of mine, Mark Randazzo, cruiserweight champ, and all this kind of stuff. You got into the boxing game. Was it just in a business sense? Yeah, I mean, look, we were always around fighters, you know. When I was with uh, Andrew Russo at the time, he was my captain. 
uh, you know, he had an interest in Vito Antifermo at the time, and we, you know, we were we were part of the game. We always got in and, and got involved, and you know, we we had interest there. You know, you know what the, the deal is. Absolutely. Like. But yeah, what happened with Don King was a big undercover inv investigation on me called shadow boxing, and uh, it was me, and uh, they tried to really set up me and Don King. And it was about an eight, nine month investigation and they had uh, an undercover agent and a guy that they actually pulled out of prison, a guy by the name of Reggie Barrett. He was around Muhammad Ali. So he knew the boxing game well. You know, he was the guy, like the inside guy. And these two guys were on me for eight months trying to get a meeting with Don King. They posed as uh, big drug dealers. Uh, the FBI set up a bank account where they had $15 million in the bank because when I brought them to Don, I said, I got to see the money. You know, and uh, I actually brought him to Don through Al Sharpton. I had Al Sharpton set up the meeting because he was working with me at the time. And Back to Tawana Brawley days. Yeah, that's right. Well, even before that. But he, wow. uh, you know, when, I, when we set up the meeting, I went in there first, Larry. One of the smartest things I ever did. I said, Don, I'll be with these guys eight months, but I don't know them before that. I said, in this first meeting, I want you to say everything above board. Don't say anything underhanded. Don't talk about cash. Don't talk about other ways we could earn. They want to be promoters in the business, and you're going to help them and get a piece of it. That's it. And that meeting, he was terrific. He never said anything out of the way. It was all taped. They had the whole meeting on tape. He never said a thing wrong. And then we found out later that, uh, you know, that they were agents. And, uh, but I will say this. They had 83 tape recordings on me, 83. When they turned it over to the U.S. attorney, they couldn't use one to indict me. Well, obviously, you're thinking, you know, I always tell, you know, everybody asks me, I got caught by good FBI work, period. I mean, they were, trust me, the FBI has the money, the resources, the time to do whatever they want. They never got me on a tape or even a snitch or anything of that nature. So I was kind of lucky. But you, again, you were smart. And I, I, obviously, you're here and of course you're smart. Let's get into a little bit different. You met your wife in Fort Lauderdale. You know, that's where I was running. That's where I was very strong. Uh, I had clubs. I had a clubhouse. I had my own limousine. I had houses, a boat, all the, you know, the work stuff. Uh, do, like, do you live there now? No, no, no. I live in Central Florida now. I'm actually, I told you, I take care of my mom. Right. I'm in Central Florida. I don't know, you know, the Space Center. I don't know if you know where the Space Center is. Yeah, you know, I do. The rocket goes up. I got to tell you, Flor Florida's my favorite place in the country. If, if I had my, I would be living there. I love Florida. It, I have good memories of that. It was, it was the place I used to go when I wanted to get an escape from everything. I had a house down there in, in uh, West Palm Beach, in, in uh, Delray Beach, actually. Oh, yeah. And I love it. I love it. But I'm out, I'm out here suffering in Southern California. Now. Yeah, it's not, not, not bad there. I haven't been there, to be honest, but I know I love this because of the golf weather, obviously, and the weather. And my bones ache more. I mean, you know, I, I, was, I used to fight. I got so, so many scars on my hands from back in the days when I was an idiot, I call it. And uh, now I love the weather. And I'm here to take care of my mom. I will always do that until the right day I die. Uh, obviously, and I just want to talk. So you, you, you're with your wife uh, since 1984, right? 84. When we were, uh, I went down to actually, I started going down there earlier, but it was 83, 84 when we started production on the film. Yeah, uh, Nights of the City. I, I, I know you, like, I'm divorced twice. I'm great friends with both my ex-wives. My first wife's with my son, and she's in Brooklyn still. I love her to death. My second wife, same thing. My, my lifestyle and my prison and everything else, you know, you know what it does. They 95% of all people who go to prison, Michael, get divorced. If you go to prison for more than three years, 95. And I see it. You're just one of those 5%, and I got to give you a lot of kudos. Or be honest, I got to give your wife a lot, of, say, a lot of credit. You got to give it to her because she, uh, you know, she, she's as good as they come, Larry. I've been very blessed. Absolutely. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about, I'd love to talk about your... Uh, your relationship with certain people, mm -hmm. obviously. Obviously, we I've read, you know, you knew Gotti very well, or you had an interaction with Gotti. I've met him a few times myself. I've seen him as a hothead. He was kind of pretty of a hothead when I saw him, and I didn't want to get in his way, obviously, as a little guy, just, you know, with somebody else, and just like, holy shit, let me get out of this damn situation. Uh, Sammy, that still, as a guy who's, did his thing. I was facing the devil, as they call it, in, in, in the business. I was facing life. And I still didn't do. And you know, and I know, 
they do everything in the world to try to make you talk. Oh, we know. They know so much, but they can't prove it. And they'll tell you, oh, he said this. And, and it's really true, but they can't prove it. They just know it. They heard it and they couldn't use it somehow. And they try every book. Give you a quick one, Michael. I'm in the uh, Philadelphia. I had Rule 20 my case to Philadelphia, which I thought would be better. And so all around the country, the FBI comes and picks you with uh, uh, Dominic. Big 8 by 10 Do you know this guy? I, said, I don't know him. You know the next picture they show me, big glossy says me in front of the home stretch, you know, mm -hmm. next to a parking meter, talking to him. I go, oh, I go to the place all the time, you know, we have a few drinks there. The next picture is me in his Jaguar. I remember where we were going, Michael. Yeah. And we were actually going to Castellanos up in uh, uh, Toad Hill. And I, I, I says, nah, I just, you know, he dropped me off at the train station. The FBI laughed. He gave me a lot of credit. He goes, I go, listen, it's just not me. It's just it whatever it is. And I'm and I I'm a nobody. I don't have people sending, you know, thousands, you know how it goes. I love that. Oh, they're gonna send you money, they're gonna do this. Come on, stop the bullshit. I know what that's all about. That's old back in the fifties, maybe, or whatever it was. Uh but at this point, I looked in and I did it for myself, Michael, if that makes sense. I mean, I look in the mirror every day. No one I lost, 15-month-old baby at home, took my money, took everything, six-year-old son, and I just couldn't do it. I looked in the mirror, and it worked out blessed. I'm so blessed though, with my children, everybody. How do you look? Because I know you did the same thing. I know how you, I read you, I know you, I've met you know, people who knew you, stories. How do you look at, how do you do it? Maybe you could help me. How do you look at a Sammy now and say, because well, we know all the people he put away. Yeah. I, mean, I know a lot of them. You know, I, I got to tell you, it's... it's just, and I don't want to put you on a spot, Michael. It's okay. You, I, you know what? I don't mind talking. Look, you know, Larry, I try to be as honest with people as I possibly can. Obviously, See, there's things... That's why you're blowing up on YouTube. Yeah, but, you know, maybe sometimes there's things we'd rather not talk about. But if I'm asked about it, I'm either not going to talk about it or I'm going to tell the truth. You know, I mean, look, you know, I had discussions with my father and people about Sammy and, you know, obviously the word on the street was no good and this and that. And, and look, John had a lot of detractors too, Gotti. A lot of people did not speak well of him. But, you know, I've met with Sammy since and I've heard his side of the story. And um, I'm not saying I would have done the same thing in the same position, but I kind of understand hearing him a little bit about, you know, the position that he took. And then I said to myself, you know, who am I to pass judgment on anything? You know, it's, it's, it's not right for me. Look, I am a Christian and, and I'm, uh, you know, I've been very blessed in my life. I did a lot of bad things and for some reason I'm still here and I'm able to live my life. So, um, you know, whether you say I got away with a lot or whatever, whatever, I'm a, I'm a very blessed and fortunate guy. So I, I try not to pass judgment in that regard, but yeah, I, I mean, it is it is tough. I mean, it's tough sometimes, you know, because we just think differently. And then people will say, and I want to get this out, well, Michael, you know, you testified in the Norby Walters case. And it's true, I did, Larry. I was subpoenaed to testify in that case, but I want to want to be honest. Three times, and this is verified, three times I saved Norby Walters' life. Corky Vastola wanted to kill him. Uh, Persico wanted to kill him. And my father wanted to kill him. Because of 30 years, the guy never did the right thing that he was supposed to do. And I saved him each time. Nobody cared about Norby Walters. And, and I knew what I was doing. Norby never did one day in jail. I'm going to leave it at that. Not one day. I knew exactly what I was doing when I went there. And that was it. But I didn't have any, you know, I wasn't looking to cooperate and all that kind of stuff. Because it wasn't in me to do it. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't hurt the people. So, you know, I don't want to get back to something you said, which I think is very important. You know, everybody uses this term rat, 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 rat. And they're all people that don't even understand what that means. You know, look, if you're a legitimate guy, somebody's robbing your house, call the police. You're not a rat. You're a legitimate person doing what you're supposed to do. The police are out there to protect you. I have five daughters and a wife. When they walk down the street, I want the police to protect them. I, res I support them I 100% in that regard. Same thing like you said. Don't frame us. You have enough resources, enough money, you're the federal government, you have all the tools to come and get us legitimately. And if you can't do it, just don't frame us because then we lose respect for you. But if you do your job and you beat me, well, you beat me. 
We're on different sides. That's why I have no animosity towards uh, Joe Pistone. I met him after he's a nice guy. He was doing his work. And he did it effectively, unfortunately, for a lot of guys, a lot of friends of mine, you know. But look, when we're careless and we make those mistakes, we get what we deserve. I mean, you know, we're, you know, it's like my dad. I'll just tell you this. You know, a lot of, I had discussions with my dad. Dad, what you don't understand is that, you know, our whole family was destroyed. I had a sister died on overdose of drugs. Another sister died 32 years, uh, no, 42 years old of cancer. She was a nutcase. My mother, 33 years without a husband. I mean, what that woman went through. You know, on and on and on. And I said, Dad, you know, we got to take responsibility for what we've done with our families. I mean, even my family, eight years, it was, it was hard. It's not my fault. I said, what do you mean? He said, I was framed. If I wasn't framed, I said, <laughs> but I said, Dad, you weren't framed because you were a doctor or a lawyer or a priest. You were framed because we're mob guys, you know? I'm not saying it's right, but we got to take responsibility. He wouldn't do it, Larry. No, I'm, 100% it's not my fault. And I had an issue with him over that. I said, you can't do it. You can't blame everybody else for what we did. You, you know, it's funny, Michael, because people come up to me now all the time, and they say the same thing. They say, Larry, you know, you were a stand-up guy. You went away for a lot of people. You could have got out because I was offered. You know how they offer you. Oh, you'll get three years. You're facing life at the time. And I would have kid, you'll keep your money, you'll do everything. And it just, again, but they come up to me now and they say, well, don't you hate him? I said, you know, I'm past hate. I think hate hurts people. Me, if I hate somebody, I am hurting Larry. I'm not hurting them. They don't give a shit that I hate him. I'm hurting me. I'm letting them affect my emotions. And I don't want anybody to affect my emotions, Michael. So I look at things. What I do do, and I'll tell you it now. Obviously, everything's in the back of my mind. I, I associate with people you want to associate with everything else. What I mean by that is there's no way Larry would ever do a business deal in any deal with a Sammy Gravano, just knowing what he's capable of doing. Do I want to kill these people? Do I, you know, back when I was in, it was like, oh, I don't care about rats. I'll fucking shoot them all. I hate them. Yeah, get out if they didn't. You know, fuck, come on, stop the fucking bullshit I tell people. Listen, you're going to go to prison for some jerk off that you don't even know, you don't give a shit about? No. I says, I was about making money. But I, I that doesn't make me like them or doesn't make me have to say, accept what they did. But I don't even want to, like people say to me, uh, he might be harassing. Listen, he ain't affecting me. I don't give a fuck. What he did is he's got to live with himself. Everybody has to cross their own bears. You know, I sleep very well at night knowing how I, I presented myself in my life. You know, I talk about that a lot, Michael. If I drop dead tomorrow, I want, I actually have money in my will for a party. But I, I just want it to be, hey, Larry was a good guy. He did the right thing. He tried to do the right thing. And I fucked up a lot, Mike. I lost, again, you know, this is a tough story to tell. Uh, you know, when I got out of prison, uh, my daughter was 13. Now, I went away. She was a year and a half, 15 months old. I got 13. When she was about 15 years old, Michael, she, I had her mom having trouble. So she's kind of, and I'm, I'm a good fuck. I'm disciplined. I know what to do. I'm very, but leeway. I don't bullshit with the little crap. If it's important, I get involved. One day I had an argument with my daughter. And we're very close today. My son and daughter, I love them more than life. And I have two grandkids too. And my namesake, of course, but my grandson, the third. But uh, my, my daughter said to me, where were you my whole life, dad? If that doesn't touch your heart, because she's right, but you can't change it. And I had to accept the fact that I hurt people myself. And why would I keep hate to hate this guy to do whatever? He has to deal with his family and his, the, the whatever happened. And I think that's why you're good at what you do. You're very comfortable who you are, what we went through, all of us. I mean, we did a lot of bad to people, Michael, both of us. I mean, I did. I laid guys' arms on curbs and snapped them. I, I was not a, a half guy you wanted to be around back then. I was a tough guy, and I, and I didn't care. I had this crazy mentality. And now I look in my life, and I got my grandkids, and I got my stuff, and I like to help people like you do. I speak at, at, at events, and I developed the number one program right now in the country, is Reality Check Program. And it, it was recognized on the floor of the United States Congress for that. So it, it's like, I'm proud of that. Those are the better things of my life. Yes, we know that the people want to hear the crazy stories and all the crazy stuff. And, and I get that part of it. 
But at this part of my life now, I'm like you. And I just had to ask that because I know in the back of my mind, if I'm, would I want to kill him? No, I could care less about Sammy. I don't know in that regard. But could I ever really do any business with anybody I knew like that? I couldn't do it. Because I know they create caved in, a lift, in anything. But if a guy, his word was good. You know, all we got, Michael, and you know this, you were worth millions and millions of dollars. I was worth millions of dollars. It means nothing. It goes and comes. It goes and comes. Only thing we have, Michael, is our word. Really is. The only thing you and I have is our word. You know what, Larry? I, think that's important. I, I, I got to tell you, it's one thing that I really, without knowing you well, one thing I really respect, because I did a little work, you know, and I'm sure you, you did with me, is that you've built your platform here without bad mouthing people, without making up stories about people. You don't talk negative. You've built your platform on your life, on your merits, on what you've done. And that's admirable. Because there's people out there that, you know, they're trying to build their life on the back of other people by knocking and negative and 99% and of it is nonsense, you know, and stuff that you don't even bother responding to. But if you can build your platform on who you were and what you present, and, and you know, I think that's very admirable and you've been able to do that. And, and I really respect that. And I mean that. Thank you, Michael. Same with you. Obviously, you're right. I did my research. and I didn't have to do mu as much because you were pretty more well-known in that life. Uh, but I did, obviously. And I know what I... Because I won't come into an interview or anything like without knowing who the person is. And it was very easy to understand you because of where... I mean, I was 10 years younger than you. So you were pretty much out of the pick. Well, I was going, you went to back to prison and, and I knew all the guys down over on 11th Avenue and the limousine, per Persico's place on 11th Avenue and the limousine joint. Romanique, Roman, actually Carmine, Carmine's limousine was my limousine for my wedding. Oh, really? At, at the, yeah, at the, uh, at the uh, uh, Regina. Now, Michael, let me just jump into a few questions from my fans. From my people, they wanted to ask you because they've asked me. I told you a lot. Hey, can you, can you get my? Yes, we're gonna do it. And then he told them, "How big is the difference between crime in your time and crime right now?" Well, on the street, you know. Look, I always say this, and you know this, Larry. Our life still exists. There's no doubt, but it's nothing like it was during our time. You know, we we lived through the golden years of that life, and I always say the golden years of the life on the street. We're really from the 50s right through to the mid 80s and a little bit further than that when they started really coming down on us and we controlled so much. You know, you know, you were there during that time. It's different now. Guys are more low key. They don't have the same control over the unions and politically and everything like we had. Uh, but crime will never go away. You know, now they're into cyber crime. They're figuring out different things. You know, there's some things that I'm hearing that I'm not real happy about that, you know, they might have gotten into. I hope I'm hope I'm wrong in hearing that they're in, uh, you know, capturing these children, and I, I I hope that's wrong. But I've I've heard a little bit about that, you know, selling these kids. I, I hope that's wrong, Larry. I don't ever want. Uh, I I really hope that's people. wrong too, because that's something that would tweak me. To I love kids. I love young people. I believe in young people, Michael. Everybody on my channel knows that. That's you know people who down young people. I tell older guys our age. I say, listen, here's the problem. They're smarter than us. They do things differently than us. A young person takes, you and I get an iPhone. We get it, we open the book, we say this, hit this, go to this page. Here's a kit, reboot, reboot, reboot. Here it is, dad. And all it shows is they learn differently. Yeah, I get it and hand it to my daughter and say, here, do this for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do that too. But you're 100% right with the gold. And, and I always say it was different then. People weren't getting hurt for no reason. Uh, there was always a reason, even myself, when I did things to somebody, Mike, I, I only, you, you had to be in our business. Whether you robbed the car from one of our guys or you robbed the bookie or you did something, those were our life. If you were in our business, you were open game. Today, we got the government won. They have too many tools. You know, people used to say to me, Michael, it's the younger guys that can't do the time. And I said, no, you're wrong. Look it up. There's a lot of older guys that, look, you know this, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you got 10 years, 15 years. You do half time, you get on on parole, no big deal. Go back to work. Today, you know, back in the 80s, you get indicted under the RICO statute. And I know I had three RICO indictments. <laughs> you know, Me too. Yeah, you get one count, you're going down for 20 years. There's no more parole. You're doing 17 and a half. That's it.
Yep, 85% of your time, right. Guys don't stand up under that time. And now, I don't know if you know this, but you know, the Witness Protection Program was created by Gerald Schur. Uh, he was a, a Justice Department attorney at the time. He created the Witness Protection Program as a result of a case that involved my father. There was a hijacking case. Guy gets beat up, okay? Um, he goes to the law. And when he finds out that my father allegedly had ordered the, the, uh, the hijacking, he refused to talk because he said, they're going to kill me. So Jerry Scher got the idea to form the Witness Protection Program. That's how it started. This is documented. You can read it. But, um, you know, now they tell you, hey, you don't have to go to jail. You do a year or two. We'll give you money. We'll put you in a program, change your identity, bring your family with you. What do you got to worry about? Those guys are going away forever. You don't have to worry about anything. And they make it easy for people to do that. You know, and so it's it's a different. No, you're 100 percent right on that, Michael. I tell you what, I tell the guys in prison when I go in and I speak to the inmates, which I do all the time. You know, we got to have a heart for our, for our guys in prison. I tell them, listen. I do it all the time. Yeah, I say the best advice I could give you is this: if you don't want to listen to anything I said and you want to continue in crime, my best advice: you're going to commit a crime, do it alone. That's it. <laughs> do it alone. This way, if you get in trouble, it's only for you to put yourself in trouble because you can't trust anybody that you're around anymore. Forget it. Those days are gone. You know what I tell people? Three can keep a secret if two are dead. <laughs> That's right. The same thing. And, 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 I, and people laugh. And I, I, I preach that. Obviously, I don't preach to do crime. And I tell people all the time, Michael, if you're going to do something, somebody's going to know about it and it's going to continue and the conspiracy is going to continue and everything else is going to continue. So... Uh, let's jump on to another question, Michael. How's that? Uh, do you still keep in touch with any of your mob friends from back in the day at all? And what were their ranks in the family, if you do? Yeah, I, I'm actually in touch with one guy, and he was a member of my crew. His name is uh, Frankie G. I call him Frankie Gangster. I call him Frankie Gangster because you remember the opening line of Goodfellas? All I ever wanted to do was be a gangster? Yeah. <laughs> well, that was this guy. <laughs> And he was a member of my crew. He's, you know, he's old now. He's on dialysis and all of that. But we stay in touch. And uh, not too many. Larry, just about everybody I know during that time is either dead or in prison. I, I said that to somebody the other day, Michael. I said the same thing. I said, it's sad. A lot of my friends are either dead or in jail. And, uh, and whether it's natural, you know, cancer or something. And uh, I'm just lucky to be, uh, be around. Uh, another question. Did you see, or were you subject to, any sort of abuse that Larry has talked about? I don't know if you under, re, heard about when me. I was strapped down naked, beaten and tortured when I was in Edgefield. I was in Atlanta. I was in USP Atlanta. I was in Edgefield. It was bad prisons. And I was abused in, in Edgefield for fighting, fighting the abuses going on. They were killing people. And I started writing senators and lawyers, and, and I ended up getting to the media, and I had a big article. There's articles all over about it. And they threw me in a hole for 11 straight months, beat me, pissed on me. Op I mean, it was disgusting stuff. I call out the warden almost a lot of videos because he's a scumbag. Again, people ask me, you know, what would you do if you saw that guard that pissed on you? I said, I pray for him. I actually say that, Michael. Because how sad is your life? if you got to abuse a man who is in the worst part of his life. You must be going home to a worse prison than I was in. You must be going home to a wife that beats you or something or miserable, or whatever it is, that you got to abuse a man. So oh, true. For, for. But anyway, did you have any of that? When you went, where did you go? Uh, you know, when I was on diesel therapy, they brought me everywhere. Uh, I did the same. Yeah, way. from Lewisburg to uh, Terminal Island to Arizona to you, you name it. They had me everywhere, Larry, for several months. You know you know the deal. They throw you in there for a week or 10 days, and boom, you're shipped out, and you're, you're gone again. Legal work's gone, everything. Everything is gone. You know, and that's the roughest part about doing federal time. It's diesel therapy when they're trying to break you. But, you know, I'm going to be honest. I never had any trouble myself. I saw a lot of stuff go down, especially in Lewisburg when I was in the, uh, they had me in the basement. The basement was condemned, but they had a bunch of us down there and it was, it was animal house down there, honestly. But, you know, maybe Larry, I was fortunate. You know, I had a pedigree. People knew who I was. I had a lot of publicity and I had more people coming to me that wanted to do business. And, you know, the funny thing, Larry, I'm sure you experienced this. As the guys come to me, oh, Michael, don't worry. I figured out how to not get caught. 
And I asked him, well, how did you figure that out when everybody in here got caught? Who did you talk to that's going to teach you differently, you know? I heard the same thing. Yeah, you know, guys, oh, you know, Mike, put me in the gas business, and I'll do everything. You don't have to worry about anything. I said, yeah, until the heat comes down on you, and then I'm gone again, you know? But uh, so I saw a lot of stuff go down, you know, and uh, I was involved in negotiating people not getting hurt or getting hurt and all that. People would come to me. But I myself never had trouble, and I never, I never had any guards abuse me, not physically. You know, they, they try to. What happens when you have somebody like when you have stature in there? Some of the guards want to make sure that you know that they're stronger than you or they have more authority over you. You know what it is, so they want to put that act on. You know, but listen, I hey, I, I, I always say this, Larry, and it's funny. I said this a couple of times. People that went to jail, this Michael, you don't know how much you helped me. My father taught me to say three things in prison. Please excuse me and thank you. He said, because everybody in prison, and my dad did 40 years, that never got respect on the street, want all the respect in there. And the slightest little thing, you know, they take it as a show of respect and they gotta, they gotta show themselves to be a tough guy. So if you handle yourself right in there, at least in my case, because that's how it worked for me, I didn't have any trouble. I honestly didn't. But I saw a lot of stuff go down, especially with the younger kids, you know, fighting all the time and, you know, trying to trying to keep them out of trouble. I became a guy that wanted to keep guys out of trouble in prison. It was crazy. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, I, I wouldn't say I was that guy, but I was the guy that was uh, into everything because I, I, I didn't think I'd ever get out. My first shot was Atlanta. You know how bad Atlanta was back then, the worst of the worst. Bad place. And I went alone. And I went to prison alone, so I know the U.S. attorney said, let's, let's give him the hard. You said that these are there, we on the planes all over the country. I've been on Con Air so many times, I've freaked my flyer miles. And uh, it was so crazy. And then, you know, it, then, I, and then I ended up assaulting a staff member, and that went in my jacket. And I only found that out since I did it. Listen, I did a video, Michael, you, you're, anybody will want to see, with a, a guard who guarded me who still makes the prison pasta I made, you know, with the stingers and the whole works, and, and uh, which if you know, of course, and he still makes it, and I interviewed him. He ended up going to prison, Michael, wow. for smuggling cigarettes and uh, creatine and stuff into prison. He goes to federal prison himself. He's a good guy. He used to treat us with respect. And again, you, like you said, you treat somebody with respect, you get respect, and, and it was so funny, but that's just some great videos. Couple of more questions, Ma, I'll let you go, buddy. How hard was it to readjust to normal life out of the mob? It was very hard, I'll be honest. You know, especially moving across the country and living in California, which is so different than being back in New York. You know, I had that mob mentality. You know, you, you brought this up about, one of you, about your daughter. Uh, it was funny. I was reprimanding my son one time, my Michael Jr., who gave me a lot of trouble for a lot of years. And I was really upset with him. And my youngest daughter, she's 22 now, but she was probably 16, 17 then. She seen me getting upset with him. And she said, Dad, you're not in the mafia anymore. Stop. And she started crying. And I said, whoa, you know, because it's so hard to shake that mentality. And at times, you know, th there is a saying, and you know this, Larry, you could take the boy out of Brooklyn. You can't take Brooklyn out of the boy. And I know in your case, same as mine, that sometimes we have to step back and, you know, and say, wait a second, I'm not that guy anymore. But it's still inside of you, and you got to suppress it. And that's why our faith plays such an amazing part in that, because now we're accountable to God. We're accountable to the people around us that care about us and that we care about. And we're not accountable to the street anymore. And that was the hardest thing that I had to adjust to. And even now, at times, I see myself, you know, g getting uh, overboard, and I have to pull myself down. You know, and this is 25 years later. It's, it's, it's not easy. I, I say the same thing. Don't let my gorilla come out because I know what I'm capable of. And I never want that to come out. And I, I, I practice calmness. I, listen, I, like you, I lived, I lived in a prison cell. I was in a hole for three years, Mike. I, I lived in a cell. So I don't need the trappings. I don't need certain things. And I know what I'm capable of living in. So I, say, I, can't, I, don't, I try not to let things bother me. And I say, hey, Larry, just, it's not that big of a deal. Step back, relax. You know, like you said, cause it's, you know, when I said something to my crew and I had my crew of four guys that, that I mean, I say, they jump, you know, and I had to make sure 
I'm not like that. Stop it. Because even, you know, in my relationship, you know, you're such a strong, strong-willed, strong person. And it's just the way you can be aggressive without even knowing it. And I have to catch myself. But, all right, here's another one. Here's a good one. How did you feel when your partner, Salvador Larizzo, Larizzo turned government informant? You know, it was hard, Larry, because, you know, we were together about seven years and uh, so close that, you know, in my first while, I was married also 35 years ago. We were married for about uh, 10 years. And um, his kids called me Uncle Mike. My kids called him Uncle Larry. We were that tight. But, you know, so it was tough. But I always knew that if it really came down to it, he wouldn't stand up. I always knew. It's true. You do know that. You could sense it. And you know what, Larry? I'm going to tell you this. And, again, I don't know if I've ever said this before. But when, when he was going down and we had a feeling that he was going to go the wrong way, they wanted me to kill him. They said, Michael, we'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. You do it. And I, I couldn't do it. I said, you know what? I know his wife. I know his kids. This is, let me deal with it the way I got to deal. I'll beat him in court. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. And you know what I believe? I believe that, you know, God knew my heart at that point in time. Maybe that was one of the reasons why I've been so blessed to be alive and free. Because look, you know, you live the street life. If you die of old age and you die free, you've really accomplished something. We, we've accomplished something. <laughs> we have, Michael. That's true. That is the truest statement in the world. I never thought in my life, First of all, I never thought in my life I'd hit 50. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I really didn't. Even going to prison, I didn't think I'd ever get out. Me going, too. And going to the zoos I went to, Lewisburg, and then, then over to Atlanta. Are you kidding me? The, guy, the guards in Lewisburg said to me, who did you piss off? You're going to Atlanta. Those are tough places. Tough places. My father did five in Atlanta, in Atlanta and Leavenworth, so I visited there for 10 years. I know that they were tough places. If you survived that, you've accomplished something. No doubt. Yeah. But, but you know what? It's so much happier. I, I agree with you, Michael. There's reasons I'm alive. I watch friends die. I talk about this on one of my videos. People ask, you know, about God and stuff. And I, I don't get too much into it, but I tell them, I, my friend told me he was going to kill himself. He did it. And I laid on the bunk. And literally, I was talking to a vent to him. And, you know, the prison in the hole. And we're doing burpees and working out. And he... Screams, you know, we're talking through the vent. You know how it is in the hole. You go to the next day, talk like it's me, you and I are talking. And he says to me, he goes, hey, brother, I love you. He goes, I'm checking out a black guy. I go, where are you going? You're in the fucking hole with me. Boom, it dawned on me. I jumped up on the silver stink and I get in the vent. And I said, man, Jack, lay down. We'll talk about it after count. It was 3.30. And sure enough, they came by, man down, killed himself, hung himself off the bunk. I laid in the bunk, Michael, I was crying, I'll never forget this. And I says, why, you know, why me, why not, what, I'm here. I was so shocked and I literally heard the words, not in my head, I have plans for you. Don't know what they were, didn't know anything. I literally, not in the head, I'm like, what the fuck, what, you know, and I was in shock. And not, I've seen many people die, but it's, it was, you know, you, you're sitting there, you talk to the guy, you got to know him. You know how it is in prison. You get to know your celly like he's brothers almost, you know. It's happened a few times. We won't get too much. Let's go on you now. A couple more. What was your relationship with Vic, little Vic Arena? I knew Vic all my life. He, it would, a lot of people don't know. He was around my dad in his earlier years. He was one of my dad's guys. So I knew him all my life. I liked Vic. You know, we got along. Uh, you know, but later on in life, I mean, in that life, guys started to mistrust him a little bit. And I, I don't want to, you know, because it, it was a suspicious thing. We used to all be talking together, and he would come around. And sometimes, you know, I had a boss. Uh, I wish he would do this. I wish he would do that. And all of a sudden, the boss knows what we were talking about. You know what I mean? And so people were pointing to Vic. And, you know, I don't know. I can't put it on him 100%, but I, I just started. So when things went down with him, I wasn't too surprised. I'll be honest with you. I was not surprised. Whether he was right or wrong, I'm not going to take a side. But, but I wasn't too surprised. But other than that, I got along with him. But I will say this. He did team up against me with John Gotti to try to make a move in the gas business against me. He did. And I didn't appreciate that. And we had words over it privately. 
And I won the argument, so it didn't work, but still, I, I wasn't happy about it. <laughs> still there. Well, you know, I knew, I used to, at, on the yard in Atlanta, I used to spit with Patty Amato. You probably know Pat Pasquale, Pat, Patty. And I used to listen to Sinatra. Every Sunday, we used to listen to Sinatra from uh, one to three in the, in the yard time, and it was great. I mean, it was just, and, and I got to know all the stories. I heard a lot, not those stories. I, I heard a lot of them, though. What was your relationship uh, with Joe Glitz? Joe Galitz, uh, there again, you know, gas business mostly relationship. He started, uh, uh, long story short, there was a guy by the name of Shelly Levine that was in the business, and um, Larry Irizzo, he was a gas business guy, and Larry Irizzo got into an argument and smacked him one day, and Shelly ran to Glitz, and that's how Glitz got into the business, and he and I had to sit down in Florida and all of this. I was so mad at Irizzo. Because I said, why don't you bring him with us instead of slapping him, making him run somewhere else, right? <laughs> but uh, Glitz and I got along, you know. I mean, I understood the deal. I said, all right, he just ran to you, and what do you want me to do, you know? So we made a deal, and, and uh, you know. Hey, when you're making a lot of money, you could do that. Yeah, you could right? You could you get, give it out. couple more, and that's it. Uh, three more. What was the worst prison you went to? For me, the wor there's two worst places I was in. Number one was the basement of Lewisburg. That place, it was condemned, actually. They opened it up, and they put us down there. They were just getting even with us. I spent about four months down there. It was terrible. But the absolute worst place was L.A. County Jail. They had me there on, uh, on murder. They called it Murderer's Row because everybody on that tier that I was on was right across the tier from O.J. Simpson was either facing a death penalty or life without parole. I was there with the Menendez brothers, with the Ninja Killers, and me on a parole violation, they threw me down there. You know, I spent 11 months down there, Larry. It was the worst sewer in the, the just the worst place, I got to tell you. But, you know, I, I'll never forget when they used to take us out to visit, you know, they had us chained and shackled. And we used to go through the prison, the jail hospital to get there. You would have thought you were go, walking through Vietnam. Guys with their eyes hanging out, their heads busted open. It was like a scene out of a movie. I couldn't, every time we walked there, I don't know. I was glad that I was in lockdown there because it was total animal house. But that, that was the worst place yeah. I was in. I, I get asked that a lot. And it, it's between Edgefield and Atlanta. In Atlanta, we had a murder a month for 18 months. So that was like, and, and you know, 15% white. You could, might as well just forget it, you know. And I got along with everybody. There's no prejudice in me. You know, we come from New York, so it wasn't that. Anyway, two more. Who was the most dangerous person you've ever met or knew? You know, I guess uh, the guy that I knew that actually enjoyed violence, enjoyed it, was Greg Scarper. No doubt. You know, the Grim Reaper, Greg Scarper. He's in our crew. I knew him very well. And uh, the guy just, he was psychotic in that way. I mean, I have to say it. How shocked were you when you found out that he was really an informant for 30 years? I was not Holy only, shit! Not only was I stunned, I was scared. I mean, you know how many sit-downs, meetings that we were all together in, how many conversations we had, how many things we discussed? I said, forget about it. This guy's going to bury us all. I was, I was stunned. You know, a couple of guys that we found out were, were cooperating for years, like him and, uh, and Willie Boy Johnson, who was around... Gotti, I was Shylock and money with him, you know, I found out he was an informer for 20 years. We were stunned to find that out. But he was, uh, yeah, he was, he was the most psychotic guy that, that I was around. And I knew Roy DeMeo, I didn't know him well, but I knew Roy, and you know, Roy's got that reputation, a couple other guys, but... I, I knew Roy, and I knew Roy, and because, uh, you know, Gambino's, and they were cutting up by Tommy Karate, you remember that whole crew, doing those crazy shits. So I knew him, I was a little younger. So I, I wasn't getting into it as much as them. Last question. And this is something you do every Monday, which I like now. I watch it. It's Mob Monday. You know, movie Mob Monday you do. What's your favorite mob movie? Again, this is crazy. I've said it a couple of times. To me, the most realistic, the most authentic, the best acted mob movie for me of all times uh, was HBO's Gotti with Armand Asante. Have you ever seen it? Mm. Yes, I did. I seen. I know the guys very well who did the one with Travolta. Yeah. Yeah, I said the same thing. And I know Leo Rossi very well. I know the people who wrote I know a lot of the people. Yes, but Asante was good. I always say to me, 
and I'm gonna ask you in a minute. I, I loved Goodfellas. I just think it was kind of, I was coming up, I was a young kid back then. Look, Goodfellas and, but, was great. I mean, look, anything that Joe Pesci is in, he lights up the screen. He was terrific. They were all great in that movie. What made you want Asante? What 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 made that movie so? I mean, it's I, I remember it obviously. I remember, and he did a great job, unbelievable job. The actor Asante, Yaman Asante, unbelievable. Him and Anthony Quinn. Anthony Quinn was brilliant as yeah. uh, as, yeah. as Neil De La Croce in that movie. It was just you know I, I knew the story so well, so I knew you know a lot of the story they got from the tapes. So it was very accurate. It was very it was very authentic in that regard. I thought Asante played Gotti better than Gotti played himself. He was that good, you know. He was that believable in that role. It was tremendous. Everybody was great. So I guess, I don't know. I mean, it just, uh, I could watch that movie uh, ten times in a row and, and, and still enjoy it. And, you know, look, honestly, too, I love The Godfather. I mean, I know it was fictional. We all do. <laughs> but it was such a masterpiece of work. I mean, it was so brilliant. Uh, you know, you got to love it. So those two were my top. And I love Goodfellas. I love Donnie Brasco, you know. Casino was great. Yeah, we love them. You know what I get, though, from old Italian friends of mine, very old, even old, you know, 80s, 90s, they got mad, you know, at the old mobsters because they actually started shaking down their own people when they came here in Italy. From Italy. You know, it's not like, oh, this glamorized, you know, we're going to take care of the oil business. They were shaking down their own fruit vendors, own people trying to make a living. So, you know, I get that. But I, listen, I love those movies. Trust me. I mean, it's just, they get you. And if they're great, like you said, Martin Scorsese or somebody like that, it's just, they go. And I'm going to mention a few things. Michael, before your books, you got six books out. I want to give you great plugs on them. Uh, please, Quitting the Mob in 1992, Blood Covenant, 2003, The Good, The Bad, and The Forgiven, 2009, I'll Make You an Offer You Can't Refuse, 2011, From the Godfather to God the Father, 2014, and The Story of the Mafia Prince Who Publicly Quit the Mob and Lived, 2018. What's your favorite book? You know, I think, uh, I think uh, God the Father. Uh, and I'll tell you why. It's, um, and, and I wrote all my books. The first book, Quitting the Mob, I wrote with a co-author. Co all the rest I wrote myself. I enjoy that. Sounds like me. Yeah. God the Father is kind of my ministry tool. I've got probably, I don't know, 10,000 of them in prisons all over the country. I really put my heart in that book, Larry. And it was really to make people understand that no matter what situation you came out of, you, you were in in your life, that with God's help, you can transform your life. And uh, it's been a very effective tool. People, uh, you know, are blessed to read it. And I, I pay, purposely made it in pep, paperback so it's cheap. And, and uh, it, it's been, uh, you know, it's been the book that I'm the most proud of. Let's put it that way. And, and I'm writing a book now, Larry, it's called Mafia Democracy. And I'm telling you, this is not a gimmick book. I am going to show people in this book how our government is, is operating more under a Machiavellian ideology than under a republic the way it should be operating. And, you know, you and I understand that because we are on the street. And when we compare some of the things of the ideology that our government is using today to the street, it's very obvious. And uh, I'm in the midst of writing it now. It'll be out early next year. I, like you, I, I self-published this one because I have experience now with all the publishers. And uh, I'm excited about it because I think it's the timing is now. We need it. We really need it. Well, you know, when that book comes out, I want to have you back on, obviously. And when that comes on, definitely, I agree with you. I'm writing a book called uh, uh, Prison Cooking with Larry Lawton. Uh, it's crazy because I got videos out there from Prison Cooking and, you know, the fun, crazy books. And I get crazy with them. You know, Mike, I want to thank you. What a great guest. Uh, obviously, you're open, you're honest. You know, I wish you the best of luck, everything you're doing. In any way I can help you or we can help you, please, just my door will always be open. Uh, and uh, come on anytime, and I'll come on anytime you want, whatever you need to, to bring people over, however we can do and work together. You've been great. I want to thank you. Well, I appreciate that, Larry. And I know my, uh, you know, followers and subscribers would love to hear you too. So one day we'll set that up in the future. And, uh, and you've been terrific. And I, again, I respect and admire what you're doing. So keep up the great work. And the same here. If I can ever be of a, you know, of a service or a benefit, you just let me know I'm here. Yeah, definitely, definitely one of my favorite interviews ever. 
and I've done so many of them. I really mean that. You were great. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate that. All right, everybody, you just heard from Michael Francis. What an amazing interview. What an open, honest, great guy. I wish him all the best, uh, and I wish him more success than, than he ever had in any bad life. He's having it now in a better way, and I'm sure of that. Listen, make sure you check us out on all of our platforms, Patreon. Make sure you check us out on the YouTube program, and also subscribe if you haven't, and keep the comments coming, and like I say on every video. Come on, make good choices. You don't need to go where I went or Michael went or live those crazy lives. Live your life, have fun, but make good choices. Have a great day, everybody.